Now we'll talk about the brain, the source of all psychological experiences. On this slide, we see the four lobes of the brain. There's the frontal lobe, which is involved with speech, problem solving, planning, and organization. On the top of the brain, we have the parietal lobe, which functions include touch and taste. On the bottom, we have the temporal lobe, which functions include sound and smell. And finally, in the back, we have the occipital lobe, which functions include vision, tracking of motion, recognition of faces, or collective features. As your textbook describes, one particularly fascinating area of the frontal lobe is called the primary motor cortex. This strip running along the side of the brain is in charge of voluntary movements like waving goodbye, wiggling your eyebrows, and kissing. It's an example of the way that various regions of the brain are highly specialized. Each of our various body parts has a unique portion of the primary motor cortex devoted to it. Each individual finger has about as much dedicated brain space as your entire leg. Your lips, in turn, require as much dedicated brain processing as all your fingers and your hand combined. Now, dividing the brain into four lobes is just one way of thinking about the anatomy of the brain. We can also divide the brain into different systems or structures. It's important not to confuse the different brain lobes, which are all parts of the cerebral cortex, with the different brain structures that include the brain stem on the bottom, the cerebellum in the back, the limbic system in the middle. Each of these two models is anatomically correct. One of the reasons I like thinking about brain anatomy in this way is because it shows the different levels of evolutionary progress. The brainstem and the cerebellum are the oldest and most evolutionarily ancient parts of our brain. These brain regions are also the most crucial for survival. In fact, the term brain dead is used when a person's brainstem stops functioning, which indicates there is no chance at maintaining life without artificial life support. The brainstem is the part of our body that is involved with all major vital functions. It includes the medulla, pons, midbrain, thalamus, and hypothalamus. Taken together with the cerebellum, the brainstem regions control our heart rate, breathing and digestion, our sleep-wake cycle, some sensory and motor function, as well as growth and other hormonal behaviors. The cerebellum is particularly relevant to physical movements like walking and balance. The amazing thing about these brain regions is that they coordinate movement without the need for any conscious awareness. Located underneath the cerebral cortex, we have the limbic system, which is derived from the next stage in brain evolution. This is a collective name for structures involved in emotion, motivation, and emotional associations with memory. It primarily refers to these structures, the amygdala, hippocampus, thalamus, hypothalamus, basal ganglia, and cingulate gyrus. As your textbook notes, the limbic system doesn't have clearly defined physical areas of the brain, as it includes some forebrain regions as well as hindbrain regions. For example, you'll notice that the thalamus and the hypothalamus are included in the brainstem and also in the limbic system. The amygdala is an almond-shaped set of neurons that is part of the limbic system and located in the temporal lobe. It's involved in processing and expressing arousal and emotions like anger or fear. The basal ganglia refers to a group of nuclei lying deep in the frontal lobes and is part of the limbic system. It involves involuntary movement and coordination. The cingulate gyrus is an area of the limbic system that lies just above the corpus callosum, which we'll talk about a bit later, and is responsible for coordinating sensory input with the emotionally significant events of our lives to create memories and regulate behavior. The thalamus and hypothalamus are involved in primary drives like food, water, sex, and body temperature. The thalamus acts as a gatekeeper for messages passed between the spinal cord and the cerebral hemispheres. The hypothalamus is involved in the experience of emotions and links to the endocrine system as well. The hippocampus is a very popular brain structure involved in long-term memory storage and memory encoding. One misconception is that the hippocampus is like a library of stored information like files on a hard drive. In reality, it operates more like a librarian, redirecting signals throughout the brain to enhance the process of remembering. Memories are not stored inside the hippocampus. Memories are stored everywhere in the brain. The hippocampus gets active mainly to facilitate those memory processes. Then at last, we have the most evolutionarily advanced part of the brain, which is the cerebral cortex. 
This includes all four lobes of the brain that we discussed earlier, and this is where we see the most advanced functions that, that humans are capable of, including consciousness, critical thinking, and moral judgment. This part of the brain allows us to have things like language, sophisticated tool use, and facilitates our ability to build large societies. We know that the brain operates contralaterally, meaning that the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body and vice versa. Although the right and left sides of the brain are not symmetrical, there is a common myth that people are either right brain or left brain dominant. With the discovery of certain brain regions like Broca's area and Wernicke's area, which are both associated with language and are located on the left side of the brain, people took this to mean that somehow people who are more skilled with language are, quote, left-brained. But this is a misunderstanding of how the brain works. Think about handedness. Most of us have a dominant hand, and most of us are right-handed, which means you prefer to use your right hand compared to your left hand, although you can perform virtually any task with either of your hands. And for many actions, it requires a coordination of both hands. But there is no dominant hemisphere in the brain. There's no preference for using the right side or left side of the brain for actions. No one is right-brained or left-brained in the way that we would be right or left-handed. The left side of the brain does have relatively more involvement with language, reason, logical processes, whereas the right side has more involvement with things like music, social processes, and imagination. But again, both sides of the brain are relevant to understanding all of these processes. By the way, since I mentioned Broca's area and Wernicke's area, might as well show you where they are in the brain. They're both on the left side and are both relevant to language. We know about these areas of the brain based on studies of patients with language dysfunction and brain damage. Damage to Wernicke's area and Broca's area both have impacts on language production and comprehension. But damage to Wernicke's area has more to do with comprehension or understanding. People with damage to this part of the brain can often form clear-sounding words, but they come out in a jumbled way, like the sentences are just gibberish. This is sometimes called agnosia, which is defined as the inability to know or understand language and speech-related behaviors. Some individuals may show deafness, which is an inability to recognize spoken language, or word blindness, which is an inability to recognize written or printed language. By contrast, Broca's area is more relevant to language production, although it does have a partial role to play with language comprehension as well. For those who have lost the power of speech, or aphasia, they often have damage to Broca's area. If you remember the character Hodor from Game of Thrones, who could only speak his own name repeatedly, he likely had damage to Broca's area. Hodor still understands what other people are saying, but can't form sentences of his own. Humans likely use spoken language for hundreds of thousands of years, but written language and recorded history only happened more recently within the past 10 to 15,000 years. The process of learning to read, which is a modern cultural phenomenon in our species history, actually creates a new region in the brain for processing words. This is sometimes referred to as a letterbox on the left side of the brain, shifting the process of faces more towards the right hemisphere of the brain. This is an example of neuroplasticity, which is how the brain changes with experience to adapt and function more efficiently. And this is also a good example of how whenever someone says this brain region does X, it's an oversimplification because people can develop new brain regions through experiences while the processes that used to take place in the old region are moved elsewhere. In this way, the brain is always operating in a way that's holistic, with mental processes distributed throughout major networks rather than localized in one specific place. So if the brain operates holistically, what's the point of knowing about the two hemispheres? One key insight from studying hemispheres in the brain is to identify how the two sides of the brain communicate with each other. The corpus callosum is a thick bundle of axons that unite the left and right hemispheres of the brain. When the corpus callosum is severed, typically through surgery and sometimes by accidents, as was the case with the famous Phineas Gage, we can see evidence that people have trouble coordinating inf information across the two hemispheres. For instance, for a split brain patient at the grocery store, one hand might put something into their cart while the other hand lifts it out of the cart and puts it back on the shelf. In this module, I will have a brief video showing the experiences of a split brain patient. So you can pause this video and go watch it on Canvas. Neuroimaging techniques are the primary ways in which we understand brain function and structure. 
positron emission topography, or PET scans, detect an injected radioactive substance as it flows into specific regions of the brain while the subject performs a task like adding numbers or does nothing. This helps us identify the activity of specific parts of the brain since areas that are active will require more blood. Therefore, more of the radioactive substance will be detected there. Functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, is similar, but it does not require a radioactive substance to be injected. Rather, it's a direct measure of blood flow in the brain. It visibly documents changes in oxygen levels and blood flowing through the brain during a task. fMRIs and PET scans have pretty decent spatial resolution, but poor temporal resolution. That means they can tell us where things are happening in the brain, but cannot tell us when brain activity is occurring. EEG, or electroencephalography, measures the electrical activity of the brain through the placement of electrodes on the skull. EEG has better temporal resolution than the other methods we talked about on the last slide because they document the process of electrical activity. But because this activity could be coming from any portion of the brain, EEG is known to have poor spatial resolution meaning that it is not accurate with regards to the specific location in the brain. CAT scans or MRI scans have more applications for understanding brain structure and have a lot of clinical applications too. They are used to examine the structure of the living brain. Changes detected in brain structure can be correlated with various cognitive capabilities like memory and behaviors. Another technique known as diffuse optical imaging or DOI can offer high temporal and spatial resolution. DOI works by shining infrared light into the brain. It might seem strange that light can pass through the head and brain. Light properties change as they pass through oxygenated blood and through active neurons. The distance the light travels, as well as changes in its intensity and spectrum, carries information that can be decoded to measure events like absorption and map their locations within tissue. As a result, researchers can make inferences regarding where and when brain activity is happening.